Hello team, this video is about the history of Premier Group, just helping um, our team and um, customers or anyone who's interested get an understanding about the origins of the business. So let's roll, I'm just talking off, off the bat here, so excuse me if there's a few few gaps, but <laughs> we'll do more of these videos. So the, the, the first thing I wanna share is that we kinda started life as a landscape design and construction company that was called Earthscape, uh, and we built that from just myself with a, a little truck and some tools, and we gradually built that over time. We, we hired some staff, and um, one obviously one staff member first, I think his name was Peter, from memory. Anyway, that was 20, 20 years ago, 22 years ago. <laughs> um, and then we went from there, and those days we were working from the front lawn of mum and dad's place, had the truck on the front lawn, and I had a little um, sort of bedroom out the back, or a little office out the back of their place, where I tried to do my quotes and invoicing and things like that. Those were tough days um, because I didn't really have a clue what I was doing. I didn't really have any business training. Um, and what I had to learn to do really fast was sell, 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 sell. I had to sell because if I didn't sell, the business would not survive. So I figured out really early on that sales were lifeblood. What I didn't figure out early on is how to read, how to understand financial accounts enough. Dad tried to help me a lot with that over the years, um, but I really struggled with that understanding because I'd had really no formal business training um, so I was very much winging it and learning. So I had to learn to sell, it was really important, otherwise we're out of business. So I had to learn how to do quotes or learn how to uh, market market the business first. We put a little ad in the yellow pages. Um, I started reaching out on the phone to different contacts who gave me um, gave me jobs, like my previous employer, uh, Parklands Contracting. They gave me some little landscaping jobs, which was awesome, much appreciated. They gave us um, planting jobs and things like that with because they used to do uh, lawns, uh, sowing lawns, and I used to, I was with them for a, for a few years sewing lawns. That was really really hard work. Um, was fantastic. Great great way to learn how to how to work <laughs> how, to, how to build an, a work ethic. Early days and late uh, early mornings and late finishes and uh, lots of back breaking, raking um, and shoveling and lots of physical work and wheelbarrowing. Just tons and tons of uh, physical work five days a week, sometimes six days a week. And then I worked in their plant nursery as well, which was really helpful. Gave me an understanding of plants and. Um, <clears throat> What, what, uh, how to keep a plant alive, sprays and fertilizers and, and propagating and all the things that you learn at a nursery. So that was good good experience as well, it was amazing. And so then we, um, so we had the one truck and it was me by myself for quite a while, for a few months and then um, early starts, frosty mornings, pull on the old stubbies and <laughs> get out there freezing cold. Um, so I got, got pretty um, acclimatized pretty quickly. So winter time, summer time, um, blistering heat, <laughs> lots of dust. But anyway, working in the rain, working in the sun, working in the cold, it was it was good. It was really good for building work ethic, and that's kind of how the brand. So that's how we how we got off the, off the ground is just getting out there, doing the hard slog, coming home absolutely exhausted. I used to sleep really, really, really well because I was always physically knackered by the end of every single day. Then we got uh, a staff member, and that helped a little bit. I could. Um, start to send him to do a bit more, like go and pick up loads of bark or river stone or things like that while I carried on on the job, or else I'd leave him on the job and go do those loads. Um, and that was before the days of, um, before the days of um, kind of cell phones, so I couldn't really do much. And then we eventually we got a, a car phone in our, in our trucks and then we could start actually following up customers while we're driving and things like that and keeping in touch and managing jobs and organizing jobs. Um, but anyway, so there was lots of planning involved because you couldn't just um, you know pick up the phone and make a phone call. Um, it was pretty, pretty. you had to be really organized and planning, couldn't rely on, on, a, on a phone. Anyway, the, um, that's by the by. And then we built, um, built it up over time. And then we got a, um, I was doing landscape design and quoting um, and all the other stuff, all the administration work as well. And then, um, we got to a point where one of my sisters started doing some work, which is the administration side. Um, I think over time, um, three, four of my sisters worked with us um, or for us before before they got married. So they leave school, work for us, and then, then went away to get married. Um, so that was great. Um, great time with them and working together was amazing. Probably not so great for them, but I really enjoyed it. Um, so thanks. Sisters, if you're listening, <laughs> they won't be. Um, and then, um, so grew from there, but again, landscaping was hard slog. Um, you had to put up with all the weather problems, you had to work in the rain, the mud. You know, some days you'd come home just covered in crap and just, yeah, but every day you come home exhausted. It was, it, was, it was a really hard slog. Then we brought a little wet cast business, um, manufacturing wet cast pavers. It wasn't really a business, that it, was, it, had, it wasn't even an operation actually. It was like a previous business that had been closed down 
and there were some moulds and a mixer and a, at a vibrating table um, at a friend's house in Cambridge. We brought that off him, and in the uh, little shed that we got on a property in McKee Street in Hamilton, we started to, uh, we put a lean-to out the back, literally with a tarpaulin over it, and started on the wet days, a um, couple of our staff would mix concrete, including myself, mix concrete, pour it, pour it into a barrow, then scoop it out of a barrow onto the vibrating table, um, and make these pavers and these um, steel molds and some plastic molds as well. So it was it was hard slog, and then we'd put them on these little um, sh um, sort of shelves or racks, and then they'd dry overnight. I think we used to leave them two or three days and then demold them, or we just demold it. We do we knew nothing really about concrete, nothing at all. So we learned really quickly about the the wet cast industry and about concrete because we had to like every day there was new problems every day we had to try and solve those problems so we figured out pretty quickly about what type of mold release to use and how long you could leave them in the molds and when you need to demold them and crazy work hard work um, wet windy cold in the winter because we always did it on rainy days and then we'd stock a bit of paving and then we'd try to use, sell that paving and use it on our landscaping jobs so that's kind of how that got off the ground um, and then we decided to you know invest keep investing more in that and so we built uh, an extension to the little shed that we had at McKee Street and we created like some drying rooms out of um, tarpaulins and very primitive and some uh, scraps of polystyrene and honestly everything was done on the on the, on the the cheap, on the fly, do more with less, right? Um, and those were hard days and I started going around and s trying to sell these products to Mitre 10 so I'd put a few samples in the back of this really ancient Hilux ute. It had done about two or 300,000 Ks, it was an ex Fulton Hogan ute. Oh man, it had done some case. Um, anyway, so there was manual, um, big heavy pavers in the back, had a little canopy, and I used to go around the Mitre 10s. I started with Mitre 10 Hamilton. I'd make an appointment with the um, garden centre manager or the trade manager and then rock up there, bring them out to the car park, open the, the canopy thing and say, oh, look at these beautiful pavers and <laughs> sell, sell them these products. And, and so Mitre 10 Hamilton, I think, was our first customer in terms of reselling. And then we built a little primitive display like an A-frame display gluing pavers onto um, a timber timber A-frame and that was their display with some some sort of printed um, signage on it. We didn't have many photos then, we had a few handful of photos. Um, we had a little simple little brochure, actually I'll, I'll show you some of that stuff, I've got a whole bunch of memorabilia, is, is, I don't know, is that how you say it? Old stuff. Um, and, and we've got all that and we'll, we'll put that into these videos and, and show that stuff but simple little DLE brochure with some very poor quality photos on it and an old totally a logo that's totally different from what it is today anyways these were the early days and then i from there they did start selling a few pavers which was awesome and then we put some um displays in their garden center like we glued up some displays in there created a little design when you look back now it's just like a joke it was hilarious but but that got us off the ground we put a four pallets of stock in there that was amazing we're like wow we've got this big order um, nowadays we have a hundred pellets in a store, you know, but <laughs> anyway, two pellets was a big order. Got them out and then we, then I started traveling to like the likes of the Auckland Mitre Tens. I think Takanini might have been our second one. We said, hey, Hamilton's doing this, they're loving it because they had no wet cast paving. Away we went. So I was trying to like run the factory and do the selling and a whole bunch of other stuff and it was pretty crazy. And we still had the landscaping business going as well, which we eventually closed down in 2008 or nine when the GFC hit and we tried to sell the business, but it was too late, we'd left it too late. Uh, the year before, I think 2007, we'd had an offer for 300 grand to buy the business and turn it down, which was just the most stupid thing I ever did. One of the most stupid things. Should have sold it on the spot and a year later it was worth nothing because we just ran out of work and our overheads got too high and blah, blah, blah. So it was really, you know, one of these mistakes that you make. Back then, 300 grand was a huge amount of money. Still is today, but uh, a lot then for, for myself because we had this tight, we had this little business. I think we were turning over about a million dollars in that in that business. Um, and making, we had some good months of profit and some bad months, and yeah, it was, it was challenging, so seasonal. Anyway, so we shut that down, and then we focused, that was that was a lot of heartache there because we had to like lay off staff and some really good people, and there was a lot of tears and upset people because no one, that some people, one guy just had a, he just had a, him and his wife had just had a baby and totally relying on their job, or everyone was relying on their jobs, and um, that was just the most horrible thing that ever, uh, yeah, anyway. Horrible, but you need to know this stuff because you, I want all of our team to know the background, where we've come from. It's really important you know our origins and our roots because it keeps us humble, it keeps us grounded, and it's really important that every new person that comes into this business understands the the, the sweat and tears and blood and snot, everything else that's gone into building building this brand to where it is today. And of course, 
it's not about me, it's about all the people that have come in on the journey along the way and, and done this stuff, but it had to start somewhere. Um, and so these are the early days. I could, I, I don't, I'll tell more stories about, there's so many funny stories that happened along the way. One terrible story was, this wasn't funny, but one of our guys, um, one day I heard this terrible yell from the back of the factory and I thought, oh no, uh, something terrible's happened. I ran out to see this guy limping down from the little batching platform that we had and um, it turns out he had been in the mixer inside it, this big drum mixer cleaning it um, and he hadn't shut off the safety switch properly and he'd been tapping around and this thing had kicked into life and it had a mesh cage over the top and he somehow had, he had a hammer in his hand, he somehow put that hammer out the hatch and he had pulled himself out just as the mixer roared into life, it had a soft start on it and he got out, it, it sort of crushed his leg and scraped it between the, the arm of the mixer and the, and the mesh. Um, but that was just terrible. Like, he, like if, he, if he hadn't, th he must have been like a cat. His reactions must have been incredible because it was you or me. Um, we would have just been just crushed to death. Like, and all I would have seen was blood and guts and everything else coming out of the bottom of the mixer. So that was terrible. But there's stories like that. I'll try and think of others as we go along with these videos. But things like that, like they never leave you. And that image and that, that scream and just like the whole dealing with getting him to the hospital and the, all the stuff just just so so like but these are the stories that I, I want to share with you guys because this is this is where we've come from so health and safety was not where it should have been by a long shot like you, you know we were just learning we, we had no idea about manufacturing we we're learning by the day um, that was a massive wake-up call for me um, he, he could have been killed in an instant um, and probably would have sent us broke, shut the business down, we would have been over over and out, out of business. That was probably in 2009 or 10, something like that. But we had so many situations, some funny stories, some terrible stories, um, and we'll share more of those. But so just I'm just trying to give you a bit of an overview um, as we go along. So then I started traveling in this ute to all the Mitre 10 megas. So I did the Auckland ones and Taronga, and we gradually got them set up. There was a lot of effort. I used to, you know, get in the stores. I'd, I'd um, deliver the pavers, or sometimes take them on a big trailer, and then glue up all the displays myself, put up all the signage myself, um, and then travelling. Another, actually, another scary story. I remember is one morning I left home at about four or five o'clock in the morning, cold winter's day, um, and it was ice. There was a frost, at, um, or a, it was the beginnings of a frost at, at home. Um, and I'd loaded up this massive, big, heavy display, big steel display, huge thing on this massive tandem trailer, probably bigger, yeah, big as this room kind of thing. Um, I started driving that to the Mega in New Plymouth, and I got through to, through Te Awamudu, and then through between Te Awamudu and Otrahonga, I think it was, um, this guy got road rage with me, and he was like up my rear end, and then he passed me, and then he just slowed right down, he was trying to stop me to get me out and, I don't know, beat me up, I suppose. Um, and so I tried to like slowly pull out and pass him because he was like stopping and then he'd speed up and this went on and on and on. I was just like absolutely terrified because there's no one around. It was pitch dark. I was in this really crappy ute with this heavy trailer behind. There was black ice on the road as well, which was, was making it slippery. Super scary, super scary. Eventually he turned off somewhere. Um, I was praying hard out like, you know, make this guy go away. And he eventually did disappear, but that was so terrifying. But there's, again, so many stories like this because we did thousands of kilometers up and down the country um, and so anyway got there got to New Plymouth by I don't know seven or eight o'clock in the morning we got this display set up and things like that and their brochure holder set up and but anyway so so I was kind of the rep and kind of trying to manage production as well and it was very challenging um, and I had very poor people in production that had no training and I was trying to like keep in touch with them from phone boxes and, and then we got a car phone and that helped a bit but it was so difficult, it was so, so challenging, like hours, like do crazy hours in a week, 70 hours, 80, 80 hours, work all day Saturday as well, um, often work at night, this is before I was married obviously, so right up till I was 27, which is when I got married, but um, but some crazy, crazy hours, and then we, um, and then sometimes I'd do a full loop, like I'd get in this little, I remember one trip in the little, <laughs> in the little Hilux driving with all the pavers in the back, uh, was pretty sluggish, right? It was gutless already, but with a whole lot of concrete in the back, it was even more gutless. Driving all the way down the we uh, west coast, um, west, yep, so New Plymouth to sell it to them, and then to Hawara, try and selling to a store, then to Wanganui Mega, then across to Palmerston, 
and then back home again, there's in the Hilux, so crazy trips, hundreds of Ks. Another time went all the way to Wellington and back in a day in that ute doing stores around there. <laughs> um, sometimes I'd stay overnight, but I'd often try and do a day trip so that I, cause I, I couldn't sort of trust or uh, the, the factory situation wasn't good enough. Um, so yeah, humble beginnings, humble, humble beginnings. We must stay grounded. We must stay connected with our core values, our mission, our vision. Um, and our values, and um, we must be always be humble and thankful. Like we've, we've, there's been so many people over the years that have fought so hard to keep this brand alive and grow the brand. Then we got um, got our first. Um, then Jackson joined me when he left school, so that was really helpful because he could sort of he helped out with operations, and I knew I could trust him in there to do that while I was out selling. And then we got another guy, Tim Miller from Thames. He joined us fresh out of school, and he was our first sort of salesman so that was really cool and it got him out on the road in the ute and then we got him a transit van a big white transit van filled that up with displays that was very heavy but that was really good because now he could start doing that you know three or four days a week um, be out on the road servicing the stores topping up their brochures getting more orders so that was really good um, pre prior to him coming along I tried we tried commission only sales people got ripped off and mucked around by all sorts of old sharks that I advertise for them on Trade Me actually, and yeah, anyway, so there's so many things. I'm gonna keep writing stories and trying to recollect all these memories so that I can keep sharing with you these 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 origin stories, these, these journey, the journey that, that we've come on. Um, and then of course, we then brought the, the Schist business and um, I can't remember what year that was, it's on our timeline there, 2012 or 2013, somewhere around there. And then we went on to buy the little True Stone business um, and then we went on to buy the wet cast, uh, dry cast factory over in Tauranga. And of course that's grown as well but that's enough for this video um just um just wanted to share a couple of little origin stories about the early days at uh earthscape and then premier group and i've got lots more stories to share in this series thanks for listening